going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda. Um, I am accompanied by Danny Abdeljabar. How's it what going, up? brother? How are you? I'm good, man. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty, 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 pretty good. Um, damn. These intros are definitely the hardest part of this show. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, totally. The landing is easy compared to like getting that running jump uh, i don't know i don't know man my, my one criticism of our last go was that you took a little too long uh on the outro <laughs> really so maybe maybe we can correct for that a little bit but you're right i think our outros tend to be smoother if not long if you know albeit longer uh but usually our outros are just like uh oh, we ran out of stuff to say all right bye <laughs> <laughs> well the thing is it's like we ran out of stuff to say it's broken <laughs> it's like we ran out of stuff to say and then i think you went on for about five minutes about you know like subscribe share and stuff like that yeah <laughs> people get annoyed with that i gotta stop <laughs> much but I'm, i still have to say it like the call to action has to be there um friendly of reminder course. rate and review the podcast if you guys <laughs> haven't yet um and like subscribe doing all that stuff um it helps tremendously and uh we really do appreciate it uh, but yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that we've been wanting to talk about. Um, I guess the the elephant in the room and, and something that we've been talking about a lot over the past, I don't know, what, three months now? This has been a reoccurring subject and it's going to be a subject again. Yep. Um, is Iran. 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 Um, so apparently... Mike Pompeo, Doughboy, Fat Man. <laughs> Call him Fat Boy or Fat Man. What do you like better? Mm, boy, boy, Fat Boy with fat, with B O I B O I. Fat Fat Boy. Um, he is saying that Iran attacked some tankers, some oil tankers in right. the in the Persian Gulf. Mm-hmm. Two of um, them. Two of them. And what's really weird about the entire situation is that Iran saying they didn't. Of course, they're going to say they didn't, but Nat- naturally, naturally. But what makes it really weird? What makes it a story? Because this has been a game, you know, for the past fifteen years. It seems like since the eighties, really. I mean, when the first time that we struck an Iranian, we we, we engaged with Iran in in uh, the Persian Gulf was was During Operation the ten- yeah, Operation the- Mantis. Right, and the tanker wars in the 1980s, in the late 1980s. Yeah, and during the Iran-Iraq war. Mm-hmm. That was the first time, but it's been a reoccurring theme because Iran is always, you know, since that happened, Iran, their primary goal with their Navy was to prevent the U.S. Navy from stopping them from closing the Strait of Hormuz. Like, that's always been their their prime operative. And in a war game that was conducted in 2003, we did a podcast that called the Millennium Challenge that was uh, conducted by uh, General Paul Van Riper. Um, Iran won. Well, a fictional Middle East country that was supposed to be Iran beat them by using the type of uh, military techniques that they were really developing, which included things like just launching a really, really large array of cruise missiles and then having these just uh, regular rockets they didn't have yeah. cruise missiles but yeah they didn't have they had cruise missiles right they have cruise missiles now at least i mean they de- they have cruise missiles now um but they were able to defeat them by just using some kind of unconventional military tactics and um i mean it's always been kind of a game of chicken you know for forever between the u.s and iran when it comes to the strait of harmus and now it seems that um, I guess we're going where we made another foot closer to the, to the ultimate crash. But again, who's, who knows if there's actually going to be a military conflict. I still don't think there is. I think it's, it's still some more um, political maneuvering. However, what makes this really weird is that when this happened, um, the prime minister of Japan was over there. Shinzo Abe. Yeah. Shinzo Abe was yeah, over there. Yeah. He was over there to smooth over like uh, relationships between the U.S. and Iran, wasn't he? That's kind of awkward. <laughs> the, the way the way that I read it, the situation is that he went 
so he's the first uh, Japanese prime minister to go there in 41 years. What makes it really ironic is that Shinzo Abe, he's from a very politically connected family, and his father was in politics, and he was actually in Iran the last time they went, like as a boy. Really? So, yeah, it's interesting, but he's, mm. he's been, he's very politically connected. And the way that I read the situation is that, um, I mean, there's multiple ways that you can really read it, but here, here's my, my narrative. Um, Japan wants to buy oil from Iran. They want to mediate a deal, so there's less tensions in the Persian Gulf. I mean, that's that, that's the real obvious one. You could say that Trump maybe bit off a little bit more than he could chew. So Japan's going going there on behalf of the U.S. almost because the U.S. has kind of lost all credibility when it comes to negotiating with Iran. Right. Um, you could read it that way, but I think primary like primarily. I, Japan, they buy or they were buying a lot of oil from, from Iran. So they want to continue that deal and they want to keep that thing going on. So they're trying to go through some mediations. And what's really interesting is that there was some Japanese cargo on one of the tankers that was, uh, that was hit. Does, right. does that sound weird to you? Does that, does that raise yeah, any suspicion? Yeah, it's super weird. So that, that um, particular uh, vessel was called the Kokuka Courageous. And it was one of the two that were targeted. And it was an oil tanker. And um, some of the things that I read was like, kind of like a wink, wink from, you know, Iran to Japan saying like, hey, this is our turf, you know? From what Iran to this? Japan? Yeah. I don't understand why why Iran would want to make that move. Why why would they want to alienate one of their only people who's negotiating not on their behalf, but they're at least negotiating in their interest in the long run. They're trying to smooth out negotiations. It just well, makes to, no to sense. Gain why some, yeah, to gain some leverage in that, you know, I think that uh, you know if Japan's trying to buy some oil to smooth everything over and like decrease the tensions, they also want to you know negotiate from a position of power. Right. So if they project that power, even even via proxy. Right. Uh, and then they do a little wink, wink, like, yeah, sure, we'll do some deals. But just keep in mind, you know, we've got we have the upper hand here, you know. Iran doesn't have the upper hand, though. I know they don't, but that's like a Japan move. Japan can to... buy oil. Japan can buy oil from other countries. No, no, no. Japan, uh, Japan has all the leverage. Maybe maybe I'm um, maybe I'm misstating myself. So you, you pointed out that you said uh, Shinzo was over there uh, almost as like a proxy for the United States because the United States can't go over there and do any negotiations. I don't right? think they're there as a proxy. I'm saying you could read it that way. I don't necessarily think they're so there. So if we're reading it, if we're, if we're reading it that way, then that could be a way for them. That could be a, a legitimate cause and reason for them to, you know, do this to a Japanese vessel. Another way to read it would be that, um, and, and I want to point out like how this attack was done because uh, the, the U S actually found a smoking gun that they might be able to like um, literally read a business insider um, article about this, that um, they found like a thing that would directly implicate Iran and on that particular vessel um, they found an unexploded limpet mine. Now what a limpet mine is, is a it's a bomb right that's you put it in the water it floats you know underneath the the surface level and it's got magnets on it right like real strong magnets and when a boat passes near it or above it the magnet causes it to spring up to the uh, metal because it's a magnet attaches to the hull of the ship and as soon as it makes contact it explodes right so uh, the reason why that they can use this as an implication is because during the 1980s, the late 1980s, like we were talking about during the tanker wars, uh, Iran used those exact same mines, right? So there's a link there. And I guess another way that you could read this is that uh, maybe Iran just laid a bunch of mines in that general area and by, you know, happenstance, <laughs> Uh, the Japanese ship ended up getting exploded on one of those mines at the same time as 
the prime minister of Japan was in Iran. It could just be an unfortunate coincidence. Um, I I don't know, man. That smells. Sorry about that. I don't know, man. That smells really. That's that smells incredibly fishy to me. I don't think that Iran has any interest in complicating that relationship with Japan any more than it is right now. Um, Japan de definitely wants to, to pur purchase oil from them, and I think they actually put their they they were actually playing the politics part of it really well. Um, if you remember, and we've talked about this before, Japan recently just bought 106 F-35s uh, from the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, despite one of them just crashing prior. You know what I mean? Yeah, disappearing, I, basically. <laughs> it, yeah, one just disappeared with, uh, straight into the, I guess, the Indian Ocean. No one knows where it yeah. is. Just like uh, flight, uh, the Malaysian flight, when 90, was a 90, uh, which flight was it? I forget the exact number, but I think everyone knows what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. They just disappeared off the face of the earth. And I think you could read it like this. They bought those F-35s because they were doing it as a power play because they were going to buy it from Lockheed Martin. They were going to, they were going to give the, I guess the, the wealth, they're going to capitulate with the, the welfare that the U.S. government gives to Lockheed Martin and buy those planes so they would have the, the MIC on their side. So if they take the MIC off the ball, like off the court, then they can go ahead and they can negotiate a deal with Iran without the MIC getting in their way. Because they just bought 106 planes, and you just don't buy 106 F-35 planes. Like You have to buy them in, in, in squadrons. Like you mm -hmm. have to buy them. Yeah, you don't just buy one. Yeah. I don't know how many. I don't know how many squadrons. Um, how big a Japanese squadron is, um, but let's just say they get twenty at a time. I mean, it takes a really long time to adapt to the new, you know, air jet fighter technology. They can buy twenty planes and they can call off the rest of the deal. You know, they're not getting Lockheed Martin's not getting paid until they purchase those until those those planes are are delivered and they fully commit to it. So I, I think that that was maybe a deal to to get the U.S. MIC on their side, so they could so they, so they could have less obstacles while uh, dealing with Iran. So that's that's kind of like how I I read the situation, at least coming from the Japanese side. Um, I mean, I I just really find it suspicious, and and honestly, I find it highly unlikely that Iran would try to sabotage that because look at it, like Japan is not a third world country they're not some fringe co country that's coming to the aid of iran they are the third largest economy in the entire world if japan's the able eighth to, largest military too so i wonder if military. i wonder if they're uh if they're going to invoke some of those uh newly created war powers that they have uh to say that they were provoked japan against iran yeah remember when we talked about japan's growing military powers you know, we pointed out that one, uh, Japan now proactively sends out, uh, you know, parts of their Navy and their Air Force, uh, although I should call them defense forces, parts of their defense forces actively to, you know, um, like they were hunting pirates, for example, in the Horn of Africa, um, and they're protecting their, their uh, commercial vessels. Uh, mute yourself, dude. That's weird. Um, Anyway, sorry, I almost lost my train of thought there. So they're actively going out and and using force, right? And another thing that we pointed out was that, you know, in their constitution, it says that they won't act unless provoked, right? They won't engage unless they're hit first. And I wonder if these two things put together could mean that they would act on this. Uh, I guess a third thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, a part of their newly found war powers was that they could uh, assist their allies in foreign conflicts as well. Uh, so like if the U.S., for example, wanted to go into a foreign conflict with uh, Iran, uh, they can use that as a legal loophole. Um, so there's that. And then, again, I want to come back to this Iran side, like the motivations to blow up specifically a Japanese tanker. I think that you know, either they're they're posturing a little bit and they, they want to not, they, I don't think it's a souring the deal kind of move. I think it's more like a, uh, we have 
you know, like we've got guns, we've got weapons, we have ways to do this. So when we negotiate for oil, I, we want a good deal out of this. Like you're not going to give us a raw deal just because you're the only person that wants to buy from us. We could, we still have the option to shut down the whole straits and then you're fucked because you're buying uh, oil from Saudi Arabia. Dude, I think I disagree with that one completely. Like I, that there's no way that Iran would try to posture up against Japan while Japan is trying to make a, make a deal with them. If they're trying to ease attention, just makes absolutely no sense. I mean, right now that's not, that's not uncommon for Iran. Iran postures against fucking everybody. I ran postures since the United States of America, who has the most Look, powerful military in the world. Like, come listen, on. Iran, listen, Iran is definitely not perfect, and they don't have the best leadership in the world. However, I don't think they're that dumb. Like, why would they self-sabotage the ease of tensions when you have, a, you have the third largest economy in the world coming over saying, all right, we're trying to figure something out right here so we can continue to buy oil. Japan, yes, they want to buy oil from Iran. They don't necessarily 100% need it. And right now, Iran, they're selling oil in the black market. When you're selling oil in the black market, the buyer always has the power because the buyer is the one taking all the risk. Why are they going to go ahead? And, why are they going to fuck something up like that? It just makes absolutely zero sense that they would try to sabotage that. And All there's right, zero so, evidence. There's zero evidence that there's any. So, so then the, have, the, quest, the, the question is then why? It can why? Be, we don't know yet. Like there's no John Bolton has. He says that there's evidence that, that John Bolton and Mike Pompeo are is saying that they're going to reveal some evidence next week. But like it's like it's almost they have no credibility. Like they have zero credibility when it comes to bringing up evidence and trying to provoke war or trying right, kind of like the, the substantial right? evidence that that caused them to move, you know, uh, a, a carrier class and a uh, bomber fleet and a, you know, missile, anti-missile barrage systems over to the uh, Middle East to, you know, uh, counter substantial threats from Iran or, or, or proxy forces. I get, I get it. I know that you, like you, uh, I'm with you on it. Like, show me the money and then we can talk. Uh, I agree. This limpet mine thing is interesting because when I first uh, saw the headline for this article, I was like, oh, what? Is Iran now using their Gadir class submarines that we talked about? Those little tiny midget subs to try and like sink a couple of, you know, defenseless uh, uh, oil tankers to prove that they, that they have, you know, some guns, you know, was that it? But then when I read about that limpet mine, I'm like, all right, well, they did use limpet mines. So if we can produce the evidence of that, you know, just because they used limpet mines in the 1980s doesn't mean that it came directly from Iran or the Iranian Revolutionary Guard or the Iranian army. So then it, who? It, it, <laughs> it could be it could be anyone. It could literally be anyone. I guess yeah, but Mike not, Pompeo. But it can't be anyone though. It, it, it can there, only be a specific amount of people. Stockpile, weapon stockpiles can pile up and people can get access to them. Dude, I'm, I'm with you on that one, but like you got to think about it, right? Either A, it's Iran, right? And that's the obvious choice, I think, right? Because it, it, it's, it's pretty damning. B, it's uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and they're just trying to like, you know, basically false flag, right? Or, or any other Middle Eastern or, or um, you know, a, a Gulf state, you know, that wants a false flag. Or C, it's the U S and they're false flagging. Like there's only a, a, like a handful of, of actors that I think could, could reliably not only one, get their hands on those mines, uh, but two place them in, in such a way strategically to be able to blow things up. Like, again, the, I want to point out what a limpet mine is. They float in the, in the fucking ocean, you know, like they're not precision guided bombs. They're just chilling there. You know, so in order for them to be effective, you either have to have a lot of them everywhere and hope that one of them goes off, or you have to know where the shipping lanes are and where the where and when those ships are going to pass and place them strategically that way. So there's only so many people that can either get their hands on that many or be able to place them that specifically. That's what I'm saying. It's like what it's the options are on the table. And I agree with you you know, are, are the leadership in the U S and the department of defense right now is pretty light on evidence. Um, maybe next week we'll find out, but 
they're they're light on evidence and they're also light on credibility like that's why japan's over there negotiating in the first place because the u.s can't negotiate a deal they can't negotiate a deal to ease tensions with iran and and the, and the trump administration knows that they kind of bid off more than they can handle like i i just think it's highly unlikely that japan would that iran would self-sabotage the negotiation deal like this especially because like i think the main point i was trying to make was all right, you have the third largest economy coming here. Japan's not fucking North Korea. They're a, they're a primetime ally of the United States. They're a primetime player. That opens up the door for other countries in the world, countries in Europe, really, specifically, to open up trade with them as well. So I, I just don't I, – I cannot see that. I cannot see them trying to get the upper hand on on Japan in some type of weird deal. Like whether – listen, like there's been stranger things than false flag attacks. And there's – you mentioned yourself, you mentioned suspects that could have performed that. Right. And Those are also you're missing – you're also yeah. missing – like it could be an Iranian group like MEK or something like that, like one of those internal anti-regime or Iranian groups who could be doing that. I mean, those are suspects as well. Um, so the verdict is still out. Like I would be incredibly surprised if there's evidence that's presented by John Bolton that – warrant any type of military action and what would military the, action what, what would military action look like what would you just strike some iranian mine boats or something and some or some iranian oil tankers i mean i don't know but uh, i can tell you what i think would be a good idea um to what for who the u.s for the international community uh it doesn't necessarily have to be the u.s it could be nato um but i think they should send um minesweepers into the region uh to discover um any any unexploded mines that might be lurking in wait um and i think that the the international like you know like the, the global economy has some interest in that especially the oil markets you know uh to make sure that there aren't any because this equally could just be like a fucking like uh like, like let's say iran did it right but they didn't intend to blow up a, a Japanese oil tanker. That was just like, oh shit, bad coincidence. The point though is that, you know, with these mines, you either, like I said, put out a lot of them and wait, you know, or you find out exactly where ships are going to be and you put out and you strategically place them, right? So if we're saying that, if, if like you're saying, I don't, you don't see that, that Iran would want to mess up that deal, let's go with that for a second. You know, it's possible that they just put out a bunch everywhere, you know? So I think international communities should send out some minesweepers, clean up that, clean up that issue, and then take it from there. Wait, here's my question. We're talking about the most important choke point in the world. Um, 20% of the world's oil supply mm -hmm. flows through that, through that tiny, tiny little Strait of Harmos. Mm -hmm. um, what is it like? 30% actually, I'm just looking at it right now. 30% 30, 30 30, of the of seaboard and crude oil passes 30, through that. 30, yeah, thir okay, so 30%. They don't already have minesweepers going through that area? No, dude, I'm, I think I'm it's just plead, like... I'll plead my ignorance right here. There's not, I would assume that there would be minesweepers there already. If the, it, We're not talking about a huge... We're not talking about the Atlantic Ocean right here. We're talking about a like a, a space that you could probably swim across if you're. No, you, you definitely can't swim across it. It's it's a large area. It's, I know. It's, I'm it's exaggerating, very, but like it's a very large area, and the resources needed to continuously sweep for mines is unrealistic. The I I believe that the global community just goes under the presumption. You know the the I think it's like UN uh, uh, right of 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 um, right of free transportation I think it's called, um, which basically says like if you're in international waters, you're free to move around and everyone has the right to use the the the, the ocean to move around freely without being impeded on by fucking mines, you know, or other things, uh, and so. You know, it's totally possible that Iran could have just laid a bunch of booby traps in the area, right? 
or again, my alternate uh, theory is that they precisely planned the routes that, that these ships were going to go and they did it on purpose. Either way, I think that, you know, we should sweep for some mines. We should go check it out. If Iran's who we say they are and they're doing all this nefarious activity in the Persian Gulf, why aren't we already doing that? Like, wouldn't that warrant that type of action? Like, Again, dude, like it's, I'm pleading it's my ignorance. Very, like, what, it's very, it's, it's very resource, but, it's resource this intensive. Not, this, this is not the first time this has happened. This has happened last month. Well, yeah, it just happened like a couple that weeks ago. Yeah. Mine, that wouldn't spark an investigation of sending minesweepers. In, in well, so, you know, it's kind of like what George Bush said, you know, you fooled me once, shame on, shame All on right, you. Don't quote George Bush. <laughs> fool me twice. Don't quoting George Bush. <laughs> fool me once, can't fool me again. <laughs> didn't even say no, the but quote seriously, right. like, he didn't even say the quote right. We, I know, and I, and I quoted fool him me incorrectly. Once. Yeah, um, old, old, old Tennessee proverb. Oh, Texas too. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But really, like, no, okay, so it happened no a couple weeks ago, George. right? <laughs> no I love quoting Bushism. George. No quoting George Bush unless you're like, "Hey, I want to get a beer. Want to have a beer?" Like that's <laughs> the, the, the sad thing is I've heard that he's actually very cool in real life, but yeah, like, you still no quoting him as as a. <laughs> just no quoting him. <laughs> just, just no, no quoting him unless you're making fun of him. Well, I was <laughs> rules, rules, of, rules of the show. I, I um, was making fun of him. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. So back to my point. Like, uh, so a couple weeks ago, th- this shit happened with four uh, oil tankers, right? That was like last month, and we didn't have the type of evidence to suggest. That it was Iran, even though everybody. John Bolton pointed. says that we did. Yeah, well, John Bolton's full of shit. It's been a yeah, month. He John hasn't Bolton produced nothing. Full, John you know, Bolton's full of shit. He's, he's full of shit, and he hasn't produced any evidence from that particular situation. But now, according to the things that I've read, evidently the U.S. Navy has found an unexploded limpet mine. Right. So this is two occurrences over the span of a month, and we found some evidence that it was a mine. Now it's a pretty good, like we have a pretty good business case to to go and start sweeping for some mines. Well, so, I guess we'll, and I that's guess. that's that's the answer to your question. Why haven't we done it before? Because there has to be a strong business case because it's fucking expensive. There's a lot of ground to cover, uh, well, water to cover, big ocean water, wet water. <laughs> I'm sure that there are plenty of. Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and uh, Honeywell and all these companies. I don't know who makes mine sweeping boats or ships, but I'm sure they would have no problem. With yeah, they'd have no problem charging a fucking sweep. arm and they, a leg for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. I'm sure they'd have zero, zero problem at all going on a big mine sweeping extravaganza. Ooh, look, look what I found. I found the helmet from the Iranian Iraq war. Oh, this one belonged to a 12. Maybe while we're at it, we can I see if we can find out. While we're at it, we can see if we can find the. uh, (laughs) We can see if we can find all those uh, little mini mini subs, the Godier class uh, Iranian subs. Iran will love that. Yeah, we can find their little shitty subs that they had that they made a Toy Story film about. (laughs) If you guys don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about that they did really. Iran did release a video, I guess what like five months ago, just like really shitty. That, but yeah this really shitty animated video of these tiny little quote unquote, they're actually called midget subs. They're it's tiny little submarine and they propose they still have they can, midget subs in service though, don't they? Yeah, I know they're literal class, but like they, the, the claim that they were trying to make is this shitty like Soviet era, like knockoff midget sub was going to take down an entire U S carrier fleet. Like that was the shitty animation that they created. It was, it was, I remember it was the anniversary of the Iranian revolution. That's correct. And yeah, they were playing um, Queen in the background because. Yeah, they lifted Queen. (laughs) Freddie Mercury, he was, he's Iranian. uh, I think he's from, or half Iranian. Yeah, he's he's Uh, Persian. He's Persian, but um, but, they they moved because of, because they're Zoroastrian and that's not cool in Iran or whatever. Well, it's cool enough to play a song. Evidently. I guess when you only have one huge music star, then you got to go with it. Freddie was turning in his grave. Jo- 
but yeah, um, I'll, yeah, I'll just wait. I'll wait for, for John Bolton's evidence. Um, hopefully they do a better job than they did. In and so I, I, I want to point out another thing. John Bolton might have said, yeah, we found it. But everything I'm reading says the U.S. Navy has reported that they found the, an unexploded mine. So if we're talking about credibility, like I tend to want to believe the U.S. Navy. Well, I would believe the U.S. Navy more than I would believe like the State Department, but um, I still have my very strong suspicions, and I would want to see an entire investigation on that before there is any type of talk of military intervention there, mm-hmm. and um, I'd want to see multiple oh, absolutely. investigations absolutely. That, that absolutely prove. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. A shadow of a doubt which I just, I don't think you'll ever be able to get because I think that there's just too many variables that would go in there. I think it, it could be a mine if it was, let's just say if it was a mine and let's just, let's, let's throw out the possibility of a false flag, which I mm-hmm. think is likely, but yeah, I'll, let's, possible. Just, let's just throw it out just for the sake of it. Um, you know, let's pretend that we're not in the matrix right now. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's pretend that we're not in uh, the Orwellian society that we live in, and uh, that there is actual there's a possibility that it's true. And maybe it is. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm paranoid. Maybe I just took the red pot, the the too many the red, red pill. pills. Yeah. No, people who've taken too many red pills, they are crazier than I am. They suggest crazier things. They suggest things like. People have been getting – more people have been getting mad at me for things on the show, but they'll suggest things like the moon landing is fake, which I think is crazy, or the, or like, earth, is the earth is flat. Yeah. <laughs> earth is flat is crazy. <laughs> That's crazy my favorite story. one. That's hilarious. Or the the, bo- the the Bohemian Grove. That's I don't know that one. one. I don't know that one. It's, it's uh, Vampire Pedophiles <laughs> is a good one. Vampire Pedophiles is a, was, always, is, has, was my favorite Alex Jones bit. Um, Kim Trails is a classic. Oh, the Kim Trails, uh, turn the frogs gay. They're turning the frogs freaking gay. Soros and his minions are getting, uh, they're gathering and summoning satanic vampire pedophiles to take your kids, and Obama's with them. Um, you were going to make a point. So, uh, throwing out all of the, um, throwing out all the conspiracy the flag. Thing. Yeah. I, I, it, there's still a possibility it can be from a stockpile or from mines that have already been there. Um, and we don't know the exact date, but again, totally I'd want to see, yeah. I'd want to see an entire investigation that, and on that. And, um, I, I just, it does not smell right whatsoever. And, um, I f- wouldn't, if the U S was really sure that there was going to, if that was Iran, who did that, that was strategically placed to blow up a, it wasn't a, it was it was a ship holding Japanese cargo. Everyone was, no one died. I don't think. Yeah, no, died, no, right? they, no, everybody survived. They're all, everyone, they're all everyone in, survived. The yeah. Iranian Navy Thank assisted, God, yeah. assisted with the rescue. Yeah, they did. Well. Yeah. They did mm-hmm. assist with the rescue. Um, it could be anyone. It could be anyone. It could be an accident. There's just so many variables. So, We'll see. I want to see. I want to see an investigation, like a real investigation, not the Assad gone chemical weapon type investigation, like a very, very thorough one. And um, we can we can make our decision from there because we usually don't. You, you have to you you have to rely on. We should let the Japanese journal. do it. We should let the, the Japanese, Japanese do the it. The Japanese will prob will have their own investigation on this matter, mm-hmm. and well, they won't they won't jump to any conclusions because they have. They have oil interest there, and they don't. And they they would prefer to buy oil, and not have high tensions with Iran. But, and I just do not think that Iran would try to screw that up, especially since that would be an opportunity to open their doors. Like rhetoric has been kind of calming down from the Trump administration over the past couple of weeks. He's been saying things like, "No, we don't want to go to war with Iran. We want to open up the door with Iran. Like we don't. This is we don't like tension." And it's just, I just find it very, very strange that when there's a real country, one of the top U.S. ally, 
third largest economy in the world, biggest buyer of oil uh, from that region, or second biggest buyer of oil after China, um, that they would self-sabotage a deal like that, especially since Iran's under such crippling sanctions. Mm -hmm. You would think that they would try to work themselves out of that type of sanction relief. So I just think that I just think that the whole thing is retarded, and um, you gotta stop using that R word, bro. Uh, whatever, <laughs> whatever, what, whatever. That's the only time I said it on this show. So whatever. Um. All right. We'll see. Smells fishy. Well, we got what? a little bit of yeah. We we've got some time. All right. All right. So, um, what's, what's the other thing that we have lined up for today? We got, we got a bunch of, we got a bunch of little, little ones if we want to just, uh, kind of riff off some stuff. Uh, I, I do want to, um, talk about China for a second. Um, we, uh, had a show not too long ago, uh, you know, just our little bullshit session. And we were talking about the, the, um, Tiananmen square, uh, um, I was about to say reunion, <laughs> the anniversary of, uh, the Tiananmen square incident. And um, we said something on the show uh, that I'd like to bring up again and, and kind of correct a little bit. Uh, and it was that, you know, like, when was the last time you saw China protesting? And uh, just not too long ago, I saw this uh, crazy picture. Uh, and it was um, kind of like an aerial view of 1.3 million people protesting uh, in China, in Hong Kong right now. Uh, over some extradition uh, laws that they're trying to pass right now. Um, so some backstory on that. Uh, basically, China, you know, uh, Hong Kong is a somewhat sovereign city-state, uh, but they are under Chinese jurisdiction. They are a Chinese, they're Chinese territory. Um, so they mostly, like in 97, you know, the British used to, you know, have them as a colony. Ninety-seven, the British turned it over uh, back to China because their lease was up, right? And you know, ever since then, it's been a like strange uh, relationship. Like China, uh, Hong Kong still has their own currency. They have a Hong Kong dollar, I think it's called. Uh, they have a, a very unique and distinct culture. They they share, you know, um, some pretty awesome relationships with other international countries. Um, but there's still, it's still China, right? And uh, so recently China has been pushing uh, Hong Kong to implement some extradition laws, which basically means that if, um, if you do something against the Chinese state, uh, which I guess can include, you know, just false speech against Farting. the state. <laughs> Farting the wrong way. Yeah, uh, against China, that that uh, China can invoke an extradition to mainland China, um, which basically means they'll they'll you know they'll pick you up in Hong Kong and they bring you to China, mainland China, to 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 try you uh, for those crimes. Uh, and people in Hong Kong don't like that very much because you know rightfully so, totally understandably, China's got some interesting laws, right, and some very very um, interesting. Uh, uh, um, ways to censor people and they think that this is like a, br a breach on their freedoms of speech and also just their sovereignty and, and stuff like that so 1.3 million uh hong kongites hong kongers i don't know what they would call themselves um took the streets you know they're protesting right now so uh you know it was pretty it's pretty uh poignant um because we were literally just talking about how we don't remember the last time china protested on mass uh, and we were kind of wrong about that, um, mostly because you know they they did this in '97 when they when they got turned over to China. They did it again in 2003. Um, they did it again in 2014. So actually, Hong Kong specifically has a pretty rich history of protest. Um, the rest of China, I think you might have been right for, but we still could be wrong. I don't know. I thought it was an interesting follow up to our talk about China. What do you, what do you make of this um, extradition law? Um, well, Hong Kong is different than the rest of China, than like Shanghai or Beijing. So it's not crazy to see that there's a protest there, but the large scale of it, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty taken back. It's just, it's kind of crazy that I, I'm honestly, um, surprised that 
they required an extradition wall to uh, to take people out of Hong Kong. Um, I would have thought that that sort of was in place already, but I guess that's one of the things that Hong Kong is. Uh, it's one of the freedoms that they one that of the they fr- enjoyed. Yeah, because I know a lot of people who who've lived in Hong Kong, and I've only heard very positive things. Like, yeah, I know some people who live there too. They, yeah. they don't. It's not like the robot society that you think of when you think of like Beijing, where you have social credit scores like that. <laughs> like, do you would do you know if they have um, that social credit score thing that they? I don't have? think so. I don't think implemented so. in Hong Kong. Well, I know that it's not all over China either. It's in specific parts of China. They, didn't, they haven't rolled that out everywhere anyway, but Where they, I imagine that'll be like their next step. Like, oh, Hong Kong, Macau, you guys are getting this next, you know? Do you know where they have that in China? It's wherever the Uyghurs are, basically. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, among other was, places. Wherever the, wherever the Uyghurs are, that's where they have the social credit score? <laughs> yeah. Well... You got to keep track of those Uyghurs. You got to, you got to prefer to. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad, I think, because, you know, it got kind of nasty. I mean, um, I don't, I, I didn't, haven't read about any reported deaths, um, but there were definitely a lot of injuries uh, because, you know, Chinese uh, police forces were uh, opening fire on the crowds with like, you know, rubber bullets and like bean bags and like tear gas and shit like that. Saw a pretty interesting picture of a guy uh, in a mask. Like he had a, like a tennis racket and he like basically returned the <laughs> the tear gas canister uh, with a pretty sick forearm. So wait, so was this like a a police action from from like the police department in Hong Kong or was yeah, this like yeah, the Chinese from, national from, or- from from Hong Kong? So uh, I'm trying to get the story straight. So the um, I guess the mayor, I don't know what they would call her, this, uh, uh, like, ex- the chief executive of, of Hong Kong, um, you know, who's, who's uh, um, got some political ties with mainland China, uh, has been trying to push this extradition bill, and people were really pissed off about it. And they basically stormed the streets, and they were going to go to, like, the city hall or wherever the hell she was, uh, you know, to protest. And, you know, obviously, a million people descending on your on your uh position is pretty scary so she obviously called in some some police and you know riot police and shit like that to you know to keep her safe and to keep the area safe um but it escalated pretty quickly um you know they definitely used uh you know bean bags and, and rubber bullets and uh um tear gas canisters stuff like that you know your basic riot stuff um but you know, just it's it's happening in a time that's like kind of sensitive because like you know, we got that June Fourth uh, Tiananmen Square massacre anniversary. You know, it's just interesting timing. Yeah, it's rip. It's very interesting timing. Uh, just because we, I mean, it's not so long after the thirtieth anniversary of Tiananmen Square, mm-hmm. or thirty, or yeah, thirty. Thirty, yeah. But it kind of segues into another conversation that we were we were having before we um, before we started recording. We were talking about censorship stuff because we 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 were talking about that last episode that we did together. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking about censorship, and what's kind of funny about it is that people are like uh, people are asking me. They're like, um, "How did you guys not mention the Stephen Crowder stuff uh, with him going? I guess his his." his uh, sparring match or whatever you want to call it with that guy from Vox on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll, we, we recorded it before that happened. That's why we didn't talk about it. We didn't know it. The censorship episode, the reason why we decided to do that was in response to Mance Raider, or at least the reason I wanted to do it was why, uh, because of a, a podcast I, I follow um, called Free Man Beyond the Wall was censored. I didn't even know about like, like that. All that stuff with Steven Crowder happened afterwards. But um yeah they're taking a lot of people down from youtube uh the the censorship is is apparently getting really bad um on our youtube our, our youtube channel is you know it's it's really small yeah it has, less than a, it has less than a thousand subscribers so it's not like i mean 
I don't think anyone's going to go after this YouTube channel anytime soon, unless I don't think they have any reason to. And yeah, well, they wouldn't. The reason they could take, we have some content on here that they could, they could, uh, that we can get in trouble for. I don't think so. Um, my interview with uh, Richard Black. It was an interview. I, it was an interview, but it's anti-war people get censored a lot. Well, let's not tow that Talk, line too talking, much. Talking about talking about Iran, false flags gets you gets you censored. Like I literally talked about, about false flags like ten minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> if you have a huge audience and you start talking about false flags and things like that, and, and start questioning mainstream news narratives, you're more likely to get censored. That's why you see a lot a lot of the people who get censored from what I've seen are people who are libertarians, um, progressives, like, uh, like real leftists, not MSNBC liberals, like real, like real typical leftists, liberals, not typical liberals. Like um, <laughs> and then conservatives, uh, like paleocon types are the ones that are typically taking, getting the blunt of that censorship hammer. And, um, Mainstream conservatives, I, I, I guess maybe they're getting demonetized and stuff like that, but I haven't seen any mainstream conservative really get removed from a platform. Like, I don't think Ben Shapiro is going anywhere anytime soon, or or Stephen. I don't think Stephen Crowder will ever be removed from um, from YouTube. Maybe right. they'll. Maybe it's hard for them to demonet to, to monetize, but I mean, I'm sure that they're picking up revenue other ways with direct sponsorships and things like that. Like they have humongous audiences. They have millions and millions and millions and millions of followers. Right. So, I mean, I don't think that they're a lot of these mainstream conservative pundits. I don't, I don't think that the censorship stuff is really going to affect them in the long run. It's going to be, it's people who like Mance Rader, for example, um, People who talk heavy foreign policy are people who are going to be more likely um, to get to get thrown off these platforms for one. And then, of course, those people who talk about like race and shit like that, and um, which I have speak no disparage. In. Yeah, they speak disparagingly about race because there really, are good good shows that talk about race in ways that aren't disparaging. I don't really give a shit. If someone talks about race, I'm just, I'm not really interested in that, to be completely honest. Like, I don't, I just don't, I'm not interested in that topic. Um, I don't think that you should be censored, you no, know, no matter what, just because of the consequence of, I think the major consequence of the censorship stuff is that when you toss out, when you take all the, the, the crazy white nationalist types and you kick them off your platforms or, or whatever types, they become cesspools in other, in other platforms. And Absolutely. Then they, and, then they become, and then what happens is that they create these really big echo chambers. And then that echo chamber, it becomes, it becomes mantra. And then from mantra, it turns into dogma. And then you get people who turn into fucking the guy from like, I've talked, I've, this is like a talking point I've had for a while, but then you get guys like the New Zealand shooter, right? Guys who are fucking crazy. Well, that's a really good segue into that thing that well, I yeah, found. That's what, I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to segue into. Yeah. So like I was on Reddit not too long ago and I sent this over to you. So Jordan Peterson, as you know, uh, he's launching his own thing, his own social media platform. It's called Think Jordan Spot. <laughs> Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson? Uh, He's launching ThinkSpot, right? Um, and you know the thing about this that was interesting is that he's trying to make a censorship-free platform. So I actually saw this tweet on Reddit from Paul Joseph Watson, uh, and he said that uh, Jordan Peterson to launch new social media platform ThinkSpot in August. So that's just next uh, in, in about a month, a uh, month and a half. Uh, and uh, that will only ban users if ordered to by a US court. So I think that's the linchpin of this service here. Uh, and then he quotes him by saying, uh, we're in a desperate need for a platform that doesn't arbitrarily decide to throw people off because of random crowd mentality. And I brought this to your attention because obviously we talk about censorship every now and again. And I thought it'd be interesting, you know, in the context of Jordan Peterson starting his own thing because he's got a really big name and a ton of followers and like it might actually have some traction behind it. Um, 
but uh, kind of in context of our conversation and what you're saying, like uncurated, it becomes a cesspool, right? So I, I just figured we'd have a little, little back and forth about the implications of having this, like uh, this new site that uh, evidently won't censor you no matter what you say, unless the U.S. decides to shut shut you down specifically. Well, I mean, Jordan Peter's not the first one to do this. There's been other, there's other platforms that are free speech platforms. That's right. I, mean, I can think of a plenty of them. There's minds.com, mm -hmm. which I think right now is the best one out of the group. Um, then there, we're on minds. <laughs> yeah, we're on minds. Minds is, minds is, is great. I haven't been as active on it, but it's, it's good. Um, then there's VK that, and Ga um, Gab, I think, but, but a lot of these platforms, what they lack is they lack like that super powerful brand behind it. That's right. And what happens is that you just get a bunch of people who are just the weirdos, the fringes. Let's just yeah. say, let's just call the fringes. The the my biggest problem with Minds.com is is that I just get a lot of porn hookers and porn stars following me. <laughs> and and that, that's my big problem is like a lot of the people that I don't think are real. However, um, I think that would probably be a big problem with a new, a new platform. Um, well, yeah, sure. And that, that's Jordan why I kind Peterson, of Jordan Peterson is really for that to succeed. Jo all of Jordan Peterson's audience really has to adapt that, adopt that, that, um, that platform. And then, and even then, even then, it might not take off. Yeah. Well, it, it, even then, exactly, because Jordan Peterson, I'm just going to throw a number out there. Let's just say that he has an like a, a listener base, an audience base. I don't know how many copies of his book that he he sold. I know it's in the millions, but let's just say five million people. Maybe it's okay. more. Maybe it's less. It's a significant number, though. Right. Um. All those people they join Jordan Peterson's platform. Is that big enough to start a platform? Like, is that is that big enough to mm, not really? Not, like, I, suppose, I not don't know. Really. I don't think so. Not really when compared to things like Twitter and, and Facebook. Yeah. They really need other people from that. And that movement that Jordan Peterson kind of is like the one of the leaders of. Right. Um, that classical liberal type movement with like um, the likes of Dave Rubin mm -hmm. and um, – Ben Shapiro's in there. Like main, it's kind of like an alliance between the classical liberals and the mainstream conservatives. Um, that that's that's what I I look at that that whole group of the the JP. Right, and, and it's gotta um, it's gotta they gotta be careful about it too because like like you said, even if all their yeah. audiences though, like yeah, I'm sure I'm sure that they suffer censorship. Like mm -hmm. I'm sure Jordan, they, I, everyone suffers some type of fucked up thing with these algorithms um but um in I any case like, like i found i found this on reddit right and and you know even like uh, i found this on the subreddit devoted to jordan peterson and even that subreddit only has 132,000 like subscribers right um and like it's interesting because he has a name and a brand i don't a lot of the comments that I was reading and like the lines of argument were either he's going to do it and it becomes a crazy ass cesspool because all the fringe people, like you said, are going to end up on it and uh, it'll be disgusting and like just normal, apolitical, just regular people are not going to be interested in it because of that, right? Uh, or, um, you know, he's going to have to have it moderated in some way, in which case it flies in the face of the, the point of making a new thing. Uh, so that probably wouldn't work. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it made me think of like Reddit in its early days. You know, I, I found this article on Reddit itself and uh, Reddit in its early days was pretty fucked up. Um, I mean, it's still great and amazing. But the thing about Reddit is that, you know, there are a number of communities that can be started by, you know, users themselves. And those communities and groups, uh, you know, self-moderate, right? So, uh, the example that I was telling you about was that, you know, I can make a subreddit about chalk dust and, you know, people who are interested in chalk dust can join my subreddit and learn about chalk dust. The likelihood that, you know, that becomes a big, huge thing is really, really low. Um, but nevertheless, millions and millions of people use Reddit, right? 
Uh, and if you're not interested in chalk dust, you just don't subscribe to my chalk dust. Now, the thing about that is that, you know, traditionally Reddit was like, if you don't like chalk dust, if you find chalk dust objectionable or you're offended by chalk dust in any way, then you just don't subscribe to that. But it doesn't stop you from going on Reddit and saying, hey, cool picture of a dog, you know? Um, the kind of crazy thing about Reddit was that it kind of opened up a lot of really weird subreddits. So the one example that I told you about was like, they had a subreddit about like pictures of dead babies, you know? Yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah, it's really fucked up. And there's, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg kind of shit. Like there was some really fucked up things on Reddit. Uh, they've since removed that. So Reddit has turned cloak on, on their, you know, kind of free speech origins. And, and they do uh, have some pretty stringent um, uh, uh, rules and regulations. And, um, but I think the idea of Reddit and the idea of being able to self-moderate with users as moderators uh, and and fall within some generally accepted you know terms is probably the route to go if you're going to create a you know um, a censorless platform. But I I don't I think that's a utopian ideal in my opinion. I don't think that a censorless platform can exist. Um, I, I just don't think it can. Definitely not I, not I, not private and not government. I I, w- I wish it could, but the thing is though is that I, I don't. There, there's a there's a <laughs> there's a there's a debate on you know are these are these big platforms we've had this debate before Mm -hmm. and i and and i try to i actually really try to critically think about this and and um have a good take on it that's not Mm -hmm. really popular with a lot of people who probably listen to this but my take is i don't necessarily think that the people who work at twitter or the people who work at Facebook, or the people who work at Google are dogmatic in their political opinions and are trying to persuade the public into some type of specific ideology. I don't, think, that's the, I don't think that is the case. I think they probably overwhelmingly are kind of like generic liberal. Like, but like when I say generic liberal, sure. I mean most people who most people who work at those companies who live in New York and San Francisco and where all those places are headquartered across the country. You could even say just left leaning. Left are left leaning. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're left leaning most likely is because they're not that interested in politics to begin with. And they, most of the mainstream narrative that you get from like most news sources pretty left leaning like it's it's a main it's a mainstream safe liberal leaning type of message that's that's put across the average american um i don't think that they are necessarily are trying to like convert people into some ideology like other people say i just think that they typically are left leaning um i think that their main concern is is user experience and the reason why I say that is because we both worked at tech companies. Right. Um, Still I've do. <laughs> worked, yeah, I've worked in tech companies and I can tell you right now that I've, I have worked with mo- 95, I would say 90% of the people I've worked with were, were identify as liberals, but none of them would sacrifice a sales deal or anything like that because of someone's political takes right um first of all and that's just like sales people but the business but also like whole- engineering too you know like like they're not going to build a product uh that would sacrifice you know um or would alienate their user base because of political reasons yeah the main i feel like a big concern is when you rush to i think when a lot of people get flagged or when a lot of people get censored, um, a lot of it has to do with them trying to preserve a user experience um, for as, a good a good user experience for as many people as possible. Because all right, let's just take a super taboo story, uh, a very taboo topic. Um, all right, this is actually a funny story. So I met with um, I told I, I told you I I um, I met um. Tulsi Gabbard was in New York and I had the chance to meet her. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I was hanging out with um, some of the people who worked on her campaign and I was out and, and um, she made two speeches and in between, I, I was there for the first one and then there was like some, there was like some time between the- Meet and greet time? Yeah, there was like a meet and greet time, but there was some dead time and I was, I was hanging out with some of the people who, who worked with her and um, we were, I was talking to this guy and we were having this really kind of- um, intense discussion about politics and religion and um we, we were talking the conversation led to um christian zionism we were talking about christian zionist okay and so we got into this we got into this kind of like taboo territory where you can't really you don't really talk about this type of stuff in public and all of a sudden as we're talking camera comes out boom tall like tulsi gabbard's right behind us we're on live TV talking about this. Like we're on TV talking about the subject or being filmed at least talking about this for probably about <laughs> two seconds. I was just like, and we're both just like awkwardly are like deer in the headlights. I was, I was <laughs> like, are we, just, we were just talking about Christian Zionist on, on like, hopefully it wasn't live. Like that would, just, <laughs> that would be awkward. Yeah. But most people don't want to have, that conversation thrown into their face and not saying that that's not a taboo. I mean, it shouldn't be a taboo. It's nothing crazy. We weren't saying anything nuts, but we were just having a very critical conversation about it. Um, most people don't want to be exposed to it. I will say um, most people don't are not in on what it is in the first place. So when they see a meme that kind of relates to something that's taboo, um, I think Twitter sees that as a way to alienate their core user base, which is just kind of like the general population. Like they're not trying to serve the person who and, is really into Glenn Grinwald. You know, they're not yeah, trying to yeah. serve the person who's really into, you know, Justin Ramondo or Scott Horton or someone who's really into, um, you know, analyzing the Syrian war. They're not certain. They don't want it. That's not what the platform is going to make its money off of. Their platform is meant to, you know, show you LeBron James's workout routine. So I think it's driven mainly by getting as large of a user base as yeah. possible. And anything that they think the trends will, uh, anything that will, affect the bottom line in, in, in terms of, you know, getting a mm -hmm. real user base, like, and, and I say real user base because they're trying to get a real one. Um, they, they will make the speed, uh, the free speech cuts to, 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 and, to do and, that and achieve that goal. And you know what? I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And my, my big point on that is that they have every right to do so. This is a private platform. You know, this isn't a government like town hall website you know they they don't have when you sign up for this service you sign up for the service with their terms and agreements nobody reads them and part of their terms of agreements it says that they can update their terms of agreements you know and your continued use of the platform indicates your agreement to said terms and agreements and they often do let you know when those terms and agreements get updated and nobody reads them. And part of those terms have to do with the, the, the censorship that we talk about. Right. And when people get so pissed off about it, like I get it in principle, you should be able to speak your mind, speak freely, especially when people are arbitrarily uh, censored. But at the same time, we're still talking about a private company that's making decisions based on their, uh, on their expectations of making money on this private service that is free, by the way. Like Nobody pays to be on Twitter. Nobody pays to be on Facebook or YouTube or any of the, the other platforms. You know? So they're providing you a free service, and you got to play by their rules. And the argument is, if you don't like the rules, go somewhere else. And if there is nowhere else, you make your somewhere else. And that leads us back to the beginning of, the, of this point. Jordan Peterson wants to make his somewhere else. The question is whether or not that could take off. And if it does take off, the second question is, will it or won't it turn into a cesspool? Because they're not 
they're not looking out for their general population. They're just wild west, right? So it's it's kind of a cyclical argument, you know? Well, I think his platform, it's going to depend on what other big influencers are on that platform as well. I, I think that's that will probably be the big thing. My concern with all these platforms is like when there's somebody who kind of like, I'm not saying that Jordan Peterson tries to like create echo chambers or anything, but most of his fan base, I'm going to make a pretty general statement. And I know that his audience is kind of diverse, but most of his audience is, is leans, right? Mm -hmm. Most of his audience are right leaning. Um, And I don't think most of his audience really has controversial opinions at the same time. Like everyone's different. And I, I hate generalizing people, but like Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson doesn't say anything that controversial at all. Like the most controversial he thing he says is that men and men and women are different. <laughs> like that's, that's a big controversial thing that he says. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen him really tackle a really hard issue. Like, or I, when he's asked a pretty, like when he's asked his opinion on a very, on a, on something that would get you into trouble. He usually kind of dances around it. Um, his, his stances that he takes are kind of like stances that like the average like person who leans slightly right has. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a fringe person is creating this platform, but if it's absolutely free speech, then I, who, uh, or not moderated, who knows, but I don't have the solution for, for this. Uh, I don't think there, I honestly I don't, don't think there is a solution right now. I just don't. I don't I have don't. a solution. I hate censorship more than anyone. I think you should say whatever the fuck you want at all. Like you should, you should say, you should be able to go on any platform you want and drop as many N bombs and say as many J words and say as many horrible, terrible things as you want. I don't care. I don't give a shit. Um, yeah. Well, I mean like, look, but, I'll put it to you in a, in a really simple analogy. Let's say we're going to take this offline and I'm going to say I'm making the new social media and it's in my apartment, right? So I'm inviting you to come join and I have a bunch of people come over to my new social media site. It's called my apartment. And one guy comes over and he's saying despicable shit, right? He is in my apartment that I have paid for and that I have invited people to. And if I think that he's ruining the vibe, I'm going to tell him to shut the fuck up or leave. And if he doesn't leave, I'm going to force him to leave. And I have every right to do so because he's in a private residence. These social media platforms are private entities. Well, the argument that people make against them is that they're at this point, they're public utilities and that they act as publishers when they censor people. That's up for debate, but I think at the moment, the United States is not – like the legal system has not declared them a public utility. And thus, as they're acting right now, they're acting within the – you know, the accordance with the law and well within their rights and their bounds to do so. They are private entities. All right. I'll let you have the last word on that one because <laughs> uh, I wanted to – I actually kind of did want to segue into one more thing before we wrap everything up. Um, so we're both – I'm kind of a closet video game nerd, and I don't know. Are you more of a? Um, I'm out there. I'm, I'm out. I'm, out, I'm out. Yeah, I've I've come out the closet many years ago. Yeah, I'm kind of. I I like um. I like my fair share of pretty nerdy stuff. Um, for example, I like watching the occasional anime. So do I. Love it. So I just watched. One, I'm watching One Punch Man. Oh, I fucking it's love on, One Punch Man! On is the new season out? First time. It's a, it's on the first time I ever watched it. Oh, it's and hilarious! I've been, I've it's been watching. I've been watching the first season, and you cannot get away with the things that they do in Japan. <laughs> you, you cannot get away with it. One of the characters in that show is like a homosexual predator. <laughs> yeah, I know who you're talking and about. And I'm like, watch right? This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm watching this. I'm like this. This would never be released in America. Like one. Of well, the I mean, it is. It's is all like, over is, Netflix and Hulu like, and shit. Yeah, is like not only is a character like very gay, but he's always naked, and he's just he's a predator. Like he's a he right. preys on other uh, on like 
good looking men. He's in jail for it. Yeah. And I was like, this is so, this is so funny. Like, it's just yeah. so funny that this, this exists and that this that was, show is yeah. a parody of all anime and I love it. Yeah. It's really, it's, it's, it's really, it's really funny. Um, there are some other things that I found just bizarre, but I loved it at the same time. So I'm watching that. I really like it. Um, the other thing that I've been playing is uh, Cuphead. Cuphead. You ever hear on of that? Switch? Yeah, on the Switch. Mm-hmm. I haven't a, played it yet. Is it is it good? It's inc- it's awesome. It's awesome. It's a uh, it's a video. It's it's a side scrolling shooter, and they do every. It, it's all drawn. The art style is rubber rubber hose. I think what it's called. It's like a 1930s style, like Disney style art, mm-hmm. and it looks like a Disney film or you know an old Warner Brothers film. It looks it looks it's beautiful. Like it looks awesome. And it's super difficult. It's very, very challenging. If you like like those arcadey shooter games, and I, it's it's definitely really fun. And they have like an awesome like big big band swing soundtrack. It's super cool. I 100% recommend it to everyone. Um, but I was reading an article because uh, I was like looking up stuff about the game. This article popped up, and it was some fucking douche wrote an article about how the game is racist and how it shouldn't be allowed because it brings back the memories of the racist 1930s when African-Americans were portrayed in a negative light in the way art was drawn. And I was just reading this. I was like, Jesus Christ, get a fucking life. This game is a masterpiece. The art style back then was incredible for the resources that they had. And, and is there any there, racist undertones that you can- zero racist undertones and i don't i if there is if you find a cup racist because well there's no humans in it it's all the cup the main character is a cup is literally a cup that shoots bullets out of his finger and he's fighting things like cats and giant casino machines and frogs like there's there's nothing racist there's no racist stereotypes (laughs) in it there's nothing bad from the past it's not you're not drawing the frog from the wb frog and putting him in as the main oh, character. Man. You're not yeah. doing any of that. That guy was trub- that guy was troubling. And then I was just like, what? I was like reading this. I was like, whoa, what a pussy. What a pussy liberal. Like that's the only <laughs> thing that came to mind. Like a pussy, puss, pussy liberal. Um so I found that very, very funny. And it was a guy who was like demanding the game. Like, I, my, my feelings were hurt when I was playing this game mm-hmm. because it brought me back to the time of the 1930s. I'm not even African American. I'm just a white little douche boy. Um, so I found that was interesting and, um, I found another article related in that theme complaining about Mario wearing a sombrero because it was hey, culture I have, appropriation. I have, <laughs> I have that game, uh, Super Mario World Odyssey. Yeah. He wears a lot of hats in that, not just a sombrero. Is it, the but article if it's racist, he's equally opportunistic. The article is called like. Is Mario, is this culture appropriation? And it was Mario wearing a sombrero. Yeah, that's pretty soft. And I was like, Jesus Christ. This is, this is Mark. This is Super Mario and he's wearing a sombrero. Legit, I don't think, I don't think I know a single person I've ever heard of a single person that, you know, took offense to Mario in any, in any way. You have to work at a company like Vox News to get offended. (laughs) Like, or Slate. Or salon, or salon. Those are the three companies what I would expect someone <laughs> to get offended from. Um, but yeah, we wanted to. We were talking about E3 before. Yeah, um, E3 is dope. There's so many new things coming out. By the way, Final Fantasy VIII remake is confirmed. It's coming out. It's going to be on the Switch. I'm so hype about that. And of course, I know your favorite game on the Switch, Breath of the Wild, Zelda. Uh, they're making a sequel to that. I'm pumped about that. But I found an interesting article. Uh, and it related to something that I've been dying to talk about on the show, um, but we just haven't been able to slot it in. And I thought this would be a funny way to talk about it. Um, so I've always wanted to talk about these Trump tariffs. I even tweeted about it once. It was funny. Uh, nobody liked it. It's fine. Um, but basically, you know, Trump's been doing these tariffs, you know, specifically against Mexico. He was threatening to do up to 25% by October if they didn't do something about the crisis at the border. Um and then he, you know, they made a deal or something like that. That's gone. But 
still has tariffs against China, Ch China, right now, and um, you know they're up to twenty five percent. And things that are affected by it, uh, among many other things, uh, are smartphones, computers, and video game consoles. So I read this uh, article on Gamespot that was talking about how. Uh, Nintendo is moving their production to Southeast Asia, probably like Vietnam or something like that, um, because they're afraid of losing profit margin on Nintendo Switch consoles, and they're building this brand new souped up Nintendo Switch Pro or whatever they're going to call it, and they don't want to get slapped with the 25% um, tariff. And I thought it was pretty interesting because it's like, you know, when we think about tariffs, and a lot of people, even now, I mean, we, the news keeps talking about tariffs a whole lot. But even now, there's still a ton of people that, that don't really understand what tariffs are. And when Trump or any other administration imposes a tariff on another country, that is not something that the other country pays. That is something that we pay, right? So Trump hits China with a 25% tariff. That means if Nintendo still makes that Nintendo Switch in China, we're paying 25% more for that Nintendo Switch. So. I thought it might be a fun way to talk about tariffs to say, like, leave my video games alone. <laughs> no, I agree with you completely on this. We definitely come the same. Um, you're, you're coming on my more libertarian side right now. I, I, don't, I don't agree with tariffs whatsoever. I don't Free think, trade, baby. I don't, I don't think that you should be make, artificially making the price of anything uh, more expensive. Uh, if, it's foreign pro if foreign products are better, then you should buy them. Like that's, right. That's, I, have a, I have a very simple stance on it. I don't, I'm not into – I've always found Trump's um, – Trump's um, fetish with tariffs, uh, something unattractive about him. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not for it. So I, I completely agree. Yep. And um, the video game stuff, like if I was, if you're 15, if I was like 15 years old, I'd be pretty fucking pissed about this. But I mean, I guess 15 year olds can't vote. However, um, yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting case of, uh, of how tariffs can make something I mean, like this know, really popular and it's geared towards, towards a younger generation, more expensive. Yeah, right. Really, really tariffs, easy way to get you uh, to lose you some votes there, right? <laughs> when you think of whenever, whenever you think of tariffs, I, I think you the, mo the I think the first people think of are, are things like, um, I guess like cars. Steel. cars would be like the the. Or raw materials, yeah. Or raw materials like steel or something like that. That's what you usually use as case studies. But like that mid-tier product that costs like between 200 to 500 bucks, you don't really think about that because that's like what you would notice the most. You know what I mean? Right. Like you're not, the average person is not going to notice the price of steel has gone no. up because no. of tariffs. Like not, like I don't, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know right. if the price of steel went up. For was the last time you bought steel? I haven't, I've never bought steel in my life. Exactly. <laughs> I've never bought, I've never bought, you know, I've never bought milk in mass quantities. I guess you can see that as a consumer, you know, your milk products are, are high, you know, your, your gallon of milk is higher. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes with, with cars, I feel like the, the price, if you're buying a, a new car is most likely it's already cost, pretty high. It's already place. pretty high. So it's, but video game consoles, now this not only pisses off those 15-year-olds that you're talking about, but it also pisses off like the middle-class families because guess what? Come Christmas time when, you know, little Johnny, 15-year-old brat, is asking for the brand new Switch Pro or whatever the hell they're going to call it, and suddenly it went up from $300, you know, to, I don't know, whatever 25% on top of that is, you know, that really makes a difference for the, for the average, uh, you know, American that's, you know, going to be consuming these products, these families middle class folks you know yeah when you use tariffs that that's who it really affects it affects the middle class people um because all right a car goes from twenty three thousand to dollars to say to to 15 percent price hike um yeah that sucks but you're gonna buy a car once every what ten years, maybe, right? Yeah, Average you don't really see. I, I think ten years. I think it's interesting that the price of like a video game console would go up because there's also been kind of an industry standard price for that type of for like a video game console. Like Nintendo consoles have always been around three hundred bucks or so. Um, the PS4s and the Xbox Ones have been like what four hundred, four or five hundred bucks. bucks but they've, right. they've all been priced out the same the same over 
maybe what 15 years or so like they've, yeah, they've always had the same price themselves. yeah like video games themselves are all locked at 65 dollars and like have been for like 20 or more years you know yeah that's an interesting story in and of itself but like what's interesting about these video game consoles specifically it's not just nintendo it's like microsoft and sony you know they're all like selling consoles at a loss right it actually costs more to manufacture these things than it does to make it but they make their money on the software uh and on you know the the streaming services like your xbox live and your nintendo uh, i don't know what the hell they call it nintendo online whatever playstation online they make money on that stuff and they make money on licensing to the video game makers because the video game makers have to share some of their profit uh from all the video games that they sell uh back to the console makers uh but if they hike the price by 25 percent, that's not a small amount of money you know they're already taking a loss on selling these consoles it's gonna be they're gonna definitely pass that that on to the consumer there's no no other way to do it here's the thing and this is really bad for nintendo or any video game company that would prevent someone from buying the system altogether i feel you know like because exactly, exactly. I wouldn't buy i wouldn't buy an 80 dollar video game i just wouldn't i wouldn't buy a i wouldn't buy a console the reason why i bought the switch is i mean i love the zelda games that's the primary reason why i, I bought the console but console console why i bought the i bought the console I bought the council. I bought the council. They're, They're in my pocket. pocket. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I bought it because it was it was it was cheaper. It was three hundred bucks. I felt I was like it's only $300. right. That's like worth it, you know. Like it's it not five hundred dollar. I wouldn't yeah. buy. I wouldn't buy the switch if it was five hundred bucks. I just wouldn't. I just wouldn't. So it, it'd be interesting to see how that affects. I mean, the real we got to see what it looks like in Christmas, but. I'm sure their sales will be still through the roof, but you know, no one's going to stop think, playing video games, but kids are. Yeah. Yeah. Money. But, but, but there's like broader implications, right? Because now there's going to be like, you know, people are still going to buy it, but it's going to cut deeper into their pockets. And that means, you know, like that's going to suck more because then they maybe you know, maybe they're not allocating that additional 25% that they spent on that video game. And that's no, another thing else, you know? when you think about it though, like I think almost, I've never looked at a study of this, but I would imagine if you did a study on most families um, with one kid, at least mm -hmm. they would have, a, they would have a, at least one video game console on it. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder, I wonder what is the percentage of American children that have a video game console? It's um, probably pretty high. Do you, do you think it's, it's higher high. than 50%? I, I would imagine yeah, that, right? Yeah. I'd comfortably say that. Yeah. So I, I wonder, cause so that, 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 that you will see that pricing uh that that price increase so and a lot of these video game consoles are pivoting just from video game consoles like i know that xbox and ps4 and stuff like that like they're they're trying to expand to a broader market by making themselves like giant media machines like all of these things are basically like video game console plus like a roku you know like you can get all your streaming services on there the, the xbox one that's sitting on my desk right now has like hdmi in so that i can plug my regular tv into it like my cable box or whatever and i can watch tv through the xbox you know, and uh, I don't know. It's interesting. Like they're they're appealing to a pretty broad audience, and um, you know, again, I I don't think it's a good idea. You know, these tariffs, but uh, I think it has some pretty broad implications. You know, this is like a a relatively cheap uh, purchase, and it's you know, going to either ruin the the sales or it's going to really hurt the American consumer. Well, I'm glad I'm glad I uh, got you talking free markets, Danny. Hi, um, I'm all about free markets, dude. If I'm a typical liberal, that's fine. But I am definitely a free market typical liberal <laughs> for sure. I don't. I, I I believe in making money. You know, making money everywhere, all over the globe. Let's do it. Let's make money together. And I think the only way to do that is to keep trade trade free. You sound like a libertarian to me. All right. <laughs> um. All right. I think. Um. I guess we're at that time right now. Uh, yep. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining today. Uh, please remember to rate and review the show if you are if you are on Apple Podcast. Um, anything else to add? Nope. Very good. Short landing. <laughs> no? All right.